Good day, wherever you may be in the world today. Uh, this is the September 1st community call for SCURF. Uh, today we are going to talk about reputation, reputation systems and tooling, uh, primarily in kind of research environments, uh, but maybe also uh, broadly as well today. Uh, before we get into that topic, which I'm looking forward to having a great discussion on, uh, a couple of quick announcements of things coming up that you might be interested in, uh, and feel free, uh, those who are involved in this, to have some additional or add some additional color if you would like. Uh, so first things first, some opportunities to potentially get involved is tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is when the chat guild will be meeting. Uh, if you are less familiar with our chat guild, uh, that is basically a guild of people who've kind of come together and are kind of talking about what is the arrangement of our Discord server and kind of what channels are and are not serving things um, for us and accomplishing the goals that we have for engaging and having conversations uh, in our server there. So the chat guild basically meets once a month to discuss issues related to uh, our Discord setup. Uh, a week from that, uh, so way in advance, uh, the Source Cred Guild uh, will also be meeting. Uh, that is at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that is more. Uh, that is a guild that deals with our um, instance of Source Cred here at SCURF, which is active on our forum currently and is a um, incentive mechanism for high quality content. And that guild is basically set up to worry about the disbursements, kind of what type of models we're using for that disbursement, and then also what kind of parameters are active uh, on the chat overall. Uh, right after this meeting, so unguild related, uh, but right after this meeting, there is the coffee house. Uh, the coffee house is a much more kind of casual chat that takes place in our Discord server. Uh, John, Jonathan was just kind of mentioning before we hit record that that is something that we don't quite yet have a topic for, but if the discussion about reputation and reputation systems uh, goes in a good direction, that that could just kind of carry over uh, from our community call into that chat. Uh, there is also some research on the forum that relates to reputation systems. And some of this is kind of oldies but goodies, uh, content from summits. Uh, so worth checking out. And I might put the links in the chat here uh, as well uh, that were put in our community. Um, so those are kind of the things that I know that are coming up. Are there any other kind of announcements or opportunities for people that uh, someone would like to shout out for the good of the order? Uh, for the yeah, coffee, just, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no worries. I was just going to say you can find all that at scurf.io forward slash calendar, which is um, a new short URL that we have available. Cool. And for the coffee houses, uh, if anyone wants to host a future episode, you are more than welcome to. You just choose a topic you feel like you can lead a discussion on. You don't need to give a presentation or anything like that. In fact, you're not supposed to give a presentation. Just kind of lead a nice discussion while everyone drinks some coffee. Uh, the only requirement is that the topic you choose must have some sort of related research on the SCURF forum because at the end of the day, the real goal here, or rather one of the goals here, is to get people uh, engaged with the forum, uh, with the with the discussions that are already going. So if you are interested in leading a discussion on, again, any topic that has research on it on the SCURF forum, just reach out to me and we'll set you up for one of the coming Thursdays. Having been a participant in some of those conversations so far, they've been pretty cool. Um, it's neat to have just another venue for us to kind of get together and discuss some ideas that are in people's minds and also to relate it to some of the research that's on the forum. Seeing no other announcements, we'll kind of turn to the main event today, which is a discussion of reputation. Uh, hopefully people in this call had an opportunity to see earlier in the week uh, that Angel uh, announced the topic and we started already saying like, hey, here's maybe some directions that people can kind of come with some framed ideas around. Like, so what is the meaningfulness of reputation in Web3, um, in research environments? Uh, what should SCURF be doing and things along those uh, those lines? Uh, and that's some stuff that I'd really like to explore today. But first, Brian, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but um, I just wanted to mention something because I was a little AFK earlier, and I just wanted to mention it before we kicked uh, the main topic off, which was the idea of the skill sprints. Uh, we had a skill sprint um, last week about source cred where I presented how to run the algorithm and calculate the cred percentage and all that stuff. Uh, if you are looking for the recording for that, you can actually find it on the calendar. If you open the event, you'll find the recording there as one of the resources if you were uh, interested in that. And then also I wanted to mention that as far as skill sprints are concerned, kind of similar to the uh, the coffee house uh, idea, it's an, it's an open uh, concept. So if anybody has an idea that they would like to uh, use uh, to share this as an educational kind of an approach where you have a, sh a very short topic, maybe 20 minutes in duration, where you want to teach something, maybe a Web3 skill, maybe like in my case, I showed how to use source cred, uh, how to use source cred algorithm. Uh, but we want this to be an open venue. And for those of you who may be cross pollinating into other communities to kind of keep this in the back of your mind, if there are any kind of illuminaries that may have the desire to do some content marketing where they want to take their knowledge and share it in in a uh, in a kind of a venue that we're trying to build out. Uh, please feel free to connect them to me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on how all that will come together. But we're just getting started with this concept of a skill sprint, and ultimately we want to grow it into a, ser a series where we have like a set agenda and we're driving all kinds of cool topics. Um, but I don't think it's probably going to be a little while before we, we get to that level of maturity with with the format of it. So anyway, with that was all I wanted to mention. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you for the reminder on the skill sprints. I also think that that's very cool. Um, I enjoyed the one uh, that Brian led on the source cred um, modeling. And looking forward to other skill sprints that people are going to bring to the table. All right. Last call then. Well, it doesn't have to be last call. Yeah, obviously, people can interrupt whenever. Um, but with things for the good of the order, going once, going twice. On to reputation we go. So one of the reasons why this is of interest to me as far as a topic of conversation in our community is, one, as a community and organization that is interested in your research, and what happens in research, and we have people who are uh, very interested in that from kind of a decentralized science perspective. Uh, we have um, it's kind of evaluating uh, some of the conversations on the forum are about evaluating quality of research, right? So reputation uh, has uh, a part of that discussion there as well. Uh, but also, this is something that um, is maybe more top of mind to the organization as we have started thinking about like where are potential conflicts of interest uh, when people are doing research on certain types of topics. Uh, what is the reputation of, let's say, some industry leaders if they were to show up on our forum to um, discuss things, right? Like uh, kind of this idea of reputation and bias and credibility, like they kind of all uh, intersect with one another. Um, and I'm also interested in this because from a just I'm curious about how human beings behave. Um, reputation is also very interesting because it's something that can be monetized. Um, or we've seen people use their reputation to kind of monetize themselves and their own self-brand, uh, but also this can be something that can be very internal, right? Like I want to behave a certain way because it is important for my identity. Um, it is important, therefore, um, to my reputation, like I'm concerned about my reputation because like I want to be known as this type of a person. And right? so um, I want to have a certain type of reputation for whatever my motivations are, right? So those things are all interesting to me, as well as being kind of in the Web3 environment. Um, there might be some interesting ways to convey reputation in, in ways that we haven't previously been able to and potentially be able to co-construct things or um, reputations might last longer or shorter uh, than they had in the past, like all interesting areas of discussion I think that we could have. Um, but uh, also being involved in the engagement and moderation perspective uh, or um, efforts here at SCURF. I'm interested in reputation and how much reputation should matter um, when it comes to interacting with people on our forum. Uh, for example, source cred uh, does pay attention to a reputation system uh, that discourse has. So as a user of discourse, you get a trust level based on kind of some of the behavior that you've done. 
source cred recognizes this trust level and uh, one basically mints and flows more cred through that system with a higher trust system or a higher trust level uh, than a lower trust level. So uh, in a very meaningful way, right, one's behavioral reputation is starting to make some, some impacts. And I think in some previous conversations that we've had in this organization, you know, maybe not as focused as today's hopefully will be, uh, but this idea of like, you know, what does reputation matter in kind of scientific realms, right? Like, so should it matter or not that uh, a person is a well-known expert in that field or a well-known person in that field uh, when it comes to evaluating their claims? Uh, we see a lot of like, you know, we're, we're interacting with trustless systems. Uh, and so when you're dealing with trustless systems, like, should I have to deal with reputation if I'm interacting with a trustless system? Or uh, does that put even more onus on um, some trust? Like, so big questions. Uh, there's information literacy questions as well. Um, so coming from uh, academia, right? And one of the primary things we do is like, know your author. Right? It is a shortcut to whether or not something is going to be good knowledge or not. Uh, but reputation certainly impacts our the, the likelihood that we think information is going to be credible, that we think information is likely uh, to be valued uh, and valuable, um, and whether or not I take their input seriously or not, uh, kind of the reputation of a reviewer. Um, a while back when we were talking about peer review systems, um, Umar had been discussing the ideas of kind of open peer review, and one of the things that he and I had talked about is the idea that, you know, if I was seeing, if I knew, if it was a non-blind review, uh, a big heavy hitter in my field who made some comment, I'm much more willing to do the type of revisions that they're asking for than a person that I don't know, right? Like, so that reputation makes an impact there. And so sometimes it's not always, um, you know, peer review is, an, or blind peer review is not just kind of protecting uh, the reviewer, but it can also be uh, protecting the reviewee from uh, their own biases, right? So these are all kind of like big picture directions that I would like to, us to maybe think about, but then also like what can we do about it in SCURF? Um, so I just kind of wanted to set that stage. Uh, I'd maybe like to start with just kind of where we think reputation fits into the Web3 world, but Chris, I see that your hand is up. So feel free to kick us off on the discussion part. Yeah, um, I think with reputation, there are clearly some problems um, in academia concerning double blind peer review um, and how reputation could affect a person on either side of a review concerning um, if I have a well-known reputation within my field and someone's reading my paper, are they more likely to um, give me the benefit of the doubt or they may have a conflict of interest where they want to um, reduce my influence within the field so they uh, review me negatively. So th there are all these clear problems concerning reputation in, in the current double blind process and it's not perfect. And one of the biggest problems is the actual structural conflict of if I am a well-known uh, contributor to my field, one of the standards and practices is to not reference your own reference your own works within your citations list. So say um, I'm like Adam Smith and I write a paper and I don't reference anything by myself. One of the reviewers might say, you should really learn about Adam Smith and you need to really look at Adam Smith before you make any statements about this field because I think Adam Smith would have something interesting to say and would clearly say you're wrong. And this is happening more and more frequently, um, not necessarily uh, because double blind review is, is bad, but in, just in the case of increasing numbers of peer reviews happening, it's going to be more frequent. Um, so there is this practice that is at odds with the double blind review where ever so often, someone who is uh, ha has a high reputation in the field will get a scathing negative review and get rejected only to say you need to reference yourself and you need to read yourself in this uh in your revisions so um i'm not sure completely open would 
solve all of the problems, but this is where single blind with a central in with a central uh, location where identities were checked for both sides effectively. This is where the Web3 uh, functionality could potentially come into play. Whereas if someone gets a certification that like, because the issue becomes academia already has certifications. They're called degrees. So if someone gets a degree in a certain field, it doesn't mean you should take their word as gospel. More so if they do some work that is out of line and out of standards and practices, their reputation starts to come into question. So if anything, the the certification is not to say this person is automatically someone you should listen to more. So if that person does not stay in line with the certifications that they have been given, that's when those certifications start to come into question. So reputation People, I would assume, would want their reputations to be good, but this is where the imposters come in, in the sense of people who fake degrees, fake uh, experience, and fake authority want those standards to be muddled so that it's like, it, it appears as if the degree is just rubber stamped or it's, it, the certification is just rubber stamped. But in reality, you have to go through a certain set of standards and practices to get those degrees. So that's what those degrees represent. Not that this person should be listened to automatically in that field. Um, so I do think that the way that degrees have been represented concerning what they mean within academia is incongruous with what they actually represent concerning represent uh, um, reputation. But in that context, there is a place where uh, third-party declaration of certifications, because if someone has like um, AWS certification, well, that would be pretty useful to know if they're talking about uh, systems that are distributed on Amazon Web Service. If, if they have some experience and they're certified, then that implies that they at least have some level of exposure because people should be able to speak from their experience but that experience does not automatically mean that it's objectively true and there that's where web3 certification seems to be a good medium concerning if there's like a third party or a third party platform on which people can declare their certifications, then people can look at those certifications and decide for themselves whether those things mean anything or whether the things that are being uh, produced relative to those declared certifications align with what a person would expect. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for experimentation um, but it's it's more so looking at the things that are wrong with academic double blind peer review and then trying to like find the best medium between that and I don't I'm not sh like I said I, I'm not sure open completely open is necessarily the appropriate response and, and a single blind may be the best approach. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, yeah, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I had kind of a uh, tangential comment, not necessarily related to what Chris was saying, but um, more from the idea of a standard or what a, how would a standard of access be implemented across different communities? So if I earn some reputation within one community and I then go into another community, what does that reputation that I bring with me mean contextually across different communities right and how and so i was thinking kind of really at a technical level because actually here within scurf we're looking at some of these things within discord for example how can we use uh web3 to automatically assign roles to somebody 
based on some NFT that they may have, for example, or, or whatever that whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, these are just not necessarily, yeah, just kind of like commenting and just open questions, I suppose, that are kind of I'm tossing around in my in my head. Yeah, Chris, go for it. Just to further um like connect what you're saying one of the reasons i was approaching it from this way is like some professions restrict their regional practice by standards so for example law like if you pass the bar exam in one region or one state that does not apply across state lines or into a different region but that does not preclude that person from then giving advice as long as they give the proper declaration of due diligence to the person so that's where um for example like people who are in america law if you're not legally registered as a financial advisor you're not supposed to legally give financial advice um but people do it anyway uh so there is this issue of like there are standards and practices in place to restrict regional and uh, state practice within specific industries, which is also where like consulting is is where I think a lot of those people end up extending their practice beyond their legally defined boundary of their professional practice. Um, and that's where having some sort of capacity to be like yeah i'm a lawyer in indiana or i'm a lawyer in michigan or i'm a lawyer in ohio gives that person uh the credibility of saying that showing that they practice but also articulating that what they say may not be accurate because they're then discussing something outside of their jurisdiction so having that clear line of like yes this is my the boundary of my practice and beyond that anything i say is advice to be taken with a grain of salt because that's not my actual uh area of coverage i don't think go ahead and also just in the chat i'm kind of typing some tensions or themes that i'm noticing but yeah jonathan go ahead yeah, I think we're in a unique position in the Web3 space because we're working with open source software. So we're in a unique position to actually, you know, learn from decades and decades of reputation systems that have functioned really well. Uh, so going to, to Brian's comment about um, taking reputation from one community to another, if I'm a, a reputable contributor to a suite of open source software, on one repo, I can take that reputation to another repo and say, hey, look, no, I'm an honest contributor. I do good work. Here's examples of my code. Uh, and they will take that as however they want to take it. You know, that's, that's great. You're contributing over there, but that has nothing to do with your reputation over here. Or that's awesome. You can immediately become a repo maintainer over here sort of thing. And we, we watched that evolve with Bitcoin because it was created by a, an anonymous person. So uh, the or a group of people, whatever. The, the people who were in that original email thread built up reputations to the point that with that anonymous maintainer, to uh, they built up the reputations to the point that they could be given privileges and uh, power over some of the critical infrastructure of Bitcoin in those first years. On a more sort of like philosophical level, I think um, we it, it might benefit people to think of reputation as sort of the counter to the ego. So you have people who say they're very, very good at something, but it's like, if you don't have a reputation in that, then how do I know you're really, really good? Uh, so you can break that into two sort of categories. You can get reputation in information distribution or reputation in production. So I can be a really, really good builder, but maybe I'm not a good communicator or the things I communicate aren't very accurate. So I have two separate reputations there. And then at the same time, you need to th think about who's defining that sort of reputation, who's saying someone's an expert. So I could say I am an expert in something, or I could have a university like Chris is talking about or some institution say uh, I am an expert in something and they all have their own different ways to define it. But one of the cool things with Web3 is we're open sourcing that sort of process by which expertise is defined. So we can have like 18 different um i don't know medical boards that say you're an export expert in knee surgery 
Uh, and then each of those medical boards will have their own reputation as to whether or not they give out reputation to reputable people, right? So we get a little meta there, but it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to think about the different structures we can build with regards to building reputation around individuals based on production or information, uh, transferring that reputation between projects, because there's a lot of different DAOs and different projects in here. It's a fluid sort of gig economy. Uh, and then continuing to define and build on those reputations as an individual produces or continues to disseminate information. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, Brian, go for it. Yeah, just to also mention something that I think a lot about as like an IT administrator is um, the degradation of reputation. In other words, to go the other direction with it. How do we remove reputation? How does reputation decay and or otherwise be managed? Um, yeah, that's just kind of an open thought or question. Yeah, Chris. This is where I believe um, ex expiration dates on certifications are the standard that um, close the loophole of degrading uh, knowledge concerning, obviously, if we're talking about a field of technology or something that's anything effectively that's evolving, um, eventually a person's certification becomes dated. And this is where um, two year certs, or you know, in some cases, I think it's like five year cert. Uh, like, um, I know with cybersecurity, it's like I think it's every five years you have to get recertified. Um, but it's like those, those types of standards are in place in the sense of if there's an industry standard, then every organization within that industry operates by that standard. So IBM, Amazon, Google, like if you get certified for their platforms, their, their standards of certification are all going to expire roughly around the same amount of time, just because it's, you know, within that industry, they, they have all tended to agree that the certification length for their uh, industry shouldn't be longer than X amount of time. So it's like, um, as an as a third party, just allowing people to represent those uh, certifications or degrees, then I think becomes like a way to go between the academic standards and industry standards. So that um, if somebody has a degree in computer science, it's like, well, if that degree is from 1997, that might not be as relevant as someone who's got AWS certification from 2022. And to be able to look at those things, a person would then be able to decide how much weight they want to give. Right, exactly. Is 2008 information still relevant? In a lot of cases, um, depending on which part of the infrastructure you're looking at, you might go all the way back to COBOL and you're like, yeah, COBOL is like the basis for a lot of infrastructure in America where, you know, they, they look at legacy as a form of security. Um, so there, there's all these different scenarios in which someone who has COBOL certification may be the actual authority that we need to, to listen to on something just because they're working closer to the implementation in reality, but it, that's the benefit of having something that al allows all of those types of certifications and experiences to be examined so that a person's PhD doesn't just necessarily give them the most weight in the conversation, especially if that PhD is from decades ago. So I think that the idea of certification, um, and so I struggle with it on a personal level because I, I get it, like certification is important. You can have these standards and practices by people who are very experienced in a field that they are certifying uh, and the updating makes a lot of sense, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I know more people in computer science and in contracting jobs who are more expert at what they do than anyone who's certified or has a PhD in it. Like if you're just a hobbyist in software engineering, you're probably better than some people who have gone to college, if not most people, like you spend your entire life at it. 
uh, and that works for contracting, like roofing, painting, et cetera. You can have all the degrees you want, go through all the bureaucracy you want, but that doesn't make you an expert. So there's uh, there's that sort of uh, pull in the reputation space that I think Web3 has the potential to break into because it can do fluid certification based on contributions to certain things over time. So you don't need to go back to the same board every two years, every four years and get recertified. And with that structure comes the opportunity of uh, bureaucracy creep, management creep, and corruption. Uh, you can just continuously keep your your uh, reputation up to date as a good contributor by continuing to do good work and showing that you've read, you know, this research object. Every time with Web3, if you access a research object with a wallet, it can show that you've gotten it, that you've read it, and then maybe there's some some uh, standards and practices that you go through after reading it that show that you understood it or you engaged with it in some way or another. So it's a weird, uh, we're, we're shifting away, I hope, from institutions saying who's expert and people, and we're shifting into people who are experts saying mm -hmm. who experts are. Yeah, and I think what's particularly useful to consider with that potential shift, right, because you know, Web3 can maybe identify experience or we're in an environment where experience uh, might be able to be more recognized um, than previously has been able to. Uh, but this, like, even human beings uh, have a hard time with which, what part of someone's reputation is relevant at the relevant time. Like, so uh, how does that get surfaced? Like, so people already kind of struggle with that, right? So an expert or uh, someone who has high reputation um, because they do X skill really well, right? I should maybe defer to that expertise uh, in that particular context. But very often people treat um, reputation as, oh, here's a reputable person. They are reputable in all places. And we know that that is not actually uh, accurate either. Um, so people struggle with that. And I'm very interested in, you know, kind of the Web3 systems, like how well will they be at identifying when is the appropriate reputation um, valid or not um, and verifiable or not. Uh, that's kind of where some of this conversation has taken me. But yeah, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, one of the one of the sort of mental things I go through when I hear about anybody talk about Web3 is like, are we just redefining things that are sort of well understood and just contextually speaking about those well understood things in Web3, but really we're not actually talking at all about Web3, we're just talking about things that are well understood. And I guess what I'm trying to get at here is like, what part of reputation sharing can overlaps with the newness of web3 or like what what does web3 kind of bring to the table that that brings a novel solution right like so one of the other things i think is interesting to look at is the way that law regulates crypto using fiat like thinking right like th there's friction there and sometimes i think that conversations get wedged into this kind of idea of of trying to fit a web3 way of thinking into a a a kind of a constrained way of thinking um and not like kind of breaking out of it and, and i'm not saying that's what we're doing here today but like i'm trying to find that though i'm trying to find what is the novel web3 aspect of reputation sharing anyway thanks i think that's a, a great point uh that happens all over the space because there's this new technology that breaks um trust systems down into we don't need to trust people anymore we can trust you know the systems uh so you have like in, in DeSci, for example you have a bunch of companies working on like ip bringing ip into crypto versus building uh a new system that gives credit and reputation and rewards to people who develop knowledge so it, it's a weird dichotomy that happens everywhere and i'm also very interested in it, and i don't think there is an answer uh, eventually people build experiments and we figure out like, oh, they, wait, this is actually operating in a way we didn't expect. Let's lean into that a little bit and see what we can do with it. Yeah, so maybe a way to dig into that question a little bit is um, there's certainly kind of tooling that exists uh, in Web3 or Web3 adjacent um, projects uh, that 
argue that they are kind of doing some reputational stuff, right? So uh, source cred, while it's not necessary reputation, like one can kind of interpret that a little bit as like a reputation system. Like you're doing more stuff uh, by doing more stuff uh, and other people kind of responding to that. Right? Like um, one could argue that like a leaderboard, a source cred leaderboard uh, would kind of be like a reputation board. Um, so that might be a good place to start exploring this question of like how is Web3 right now through tooling choices kind of contributing to either recreating systems or um, building new systems. Uh, Chris, I think you were first, so go for it. Yeah, that was like almost like identical timing. But when when you said that, it made me think the notion of source create as a reputation system is completely contextually dependent upon the implementation. And in that, it's actually tracking activity. So it's really an activity tracking system and it's it's dependent upon the community implementing that build to decide what activity they value um, and i think what we might be seeing is the capacity for organizations to compare their internal reputation sets more easily and more readily um, and that it feels like the barrier of uh, the ivory tower coming down or the sense of it's in like an example like Apple. We don't know what's happening in their research and develop development department until it hits the shelves. Whereas with Web3, it's like you can go check in on a community at any given time, the closer they get to open source. Um, with something like source credit is pretty much completely open source. You can go check in on their community and see what's happening at every level. And that I feel like that trend, the attempted transparency, it seems to me is like the most novel thing concerning the web three implementations of repu reputation. Um, and I like, on the one hand, I do understand the notion of moving the systems of trust to the algorithm and the technological deployments to make it less reliant on uh, community or individual uh, opinions about reputation. But it's also like we have to be able to see who's building those systems to ensure that those reputation or behavior tracking systems are in fact objective or they don't have some sort of bias of the builder uh, present in, in their deployment. And I think that's where, like there obviously there's no cr clear answer of what's novel, um, but when you're talking about source cred, to me it seems like reputation does have a context dependency that is also then much easier to transfer between communities now. Yeah, Jonathan, go ahead. Is it, there we go. Uh, the, I think that's a, a huge point. The transparency behind these algorithms, it's similar to like the, the surfacing algorithms for YouTube, et cetera. Like with these, this open source culture that has been injected into this new technology, this distributed ledger technology, we're forcing people essentially, hopefully, to open source the algorithms of trust that they produce, the open source, the algorithms of reputation, so we can all follow it. And so I think you're absolutely right. Like different organizations, the, their trust, their reputation models can interact more easily. People can build their own sort of reputation algorithms based on the data produced by external algorithms uh, and, and so forth. And I think it even goes further down to the, the individual level, uh, because if we think about it, who, is, this is all about trusting without knowing, right? And we're going to trust um, someone that someone we already trust tells us to trust. Like we're going to trust someone our parents tell us about or our, our close friend or our brother or relative, whatever. So there's that innate sort of web of trust that is ingrained in society already. And if we can automate that web of trust and make reputation more um, social based, where uh, the, the score is how many people, and this is very much reducing it, but how many people uh, that I trust also trust this person? 
And then combine that with everything Chris was just saying about, well, all right, does that person also have some uh, accreditation from a trusted organization, whatever that organization or institution is? Okay, if six of the people I trust trust this person a lot and they have accreditation, I'm going to trust what this person says regarding this topic. That's the topic we're talking about. So there's a lot of um, uh, building out this the concept of a web of trust, which I do think is is the way that a lot of this stuff will end up working in the future um that i see as as very beneficial so i'm interested in that like so the point that chris also made um on this is very customizable and like brian supported that in the comments right so if we're using like source credits as an example right the any community can kind of customize what these tools do to produce um reputation so if it is so customizable um can like a new community right so if, if someone does a thing at skirf right uh, let's say we have just amazing tooling and we do all the reputational tooling in the world and we have it customized for a way that uh, does what we like skirf to be able to do and then someone goes to another community with all this skirf repu reputation is the word for today um if they have a kind of very fundamentally different set of tools um that they have a different kind of customization for even the same types of tools. Does that reputation transfer well? Um, and maybe like so more philo philosophical question, does it matter that it transfers well or not? Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, the so I think there, there's a lot of potential with the tooling that you're talking about where you're building like source code, et cetera. But I, I, it concerns me because there are people who do not play with tooling. And so they will never build reputation because they just don't want to get likes and upvotes, et cetera. So the the alternative is the social model where the tool is just the social web. Um, I think in the short term, building tools for trust like SourceGrid, super beneficial. And then taking the trust scores from those tools and bringing them to other communities where they can customize the weight they put in that sort of tool themselves. Uh, is also highly beneficial, but it does there. I, I think there is a danger there in excluding. This goes back actually to the conversation we had yesterday about um, disclosure. You, there's the danger of disclosure, or excluding a whole section of the population that just doesn't want to do it that way. Uh, so the challenge is to build a system that lets everyone participate in the way they want to participate. Yeah, and I think to to that point, somewhat like. Yeah, so there are certainly people who are not going to um, play the game of tooling. So I think part of what we are trying to maybe wrestle with is how do you maybe build tools or set tools up in a way that one does not have to play at tooling for it to work, right? Like, so um, I think that that is part of what the source cred guild is trying to do with that specific tool is like, how do you people get benefit from this, even if they are not trying to play the source cred game, let's say. Um, but I do like this idea of you're like, you know, how do you put that? How do you put a person who doesn't want to necessarily play that game and uh, still get some benefit? Uh, the social web idea, I think, is interesting. And in maybe, you know, are there some examples that we could point to that are kind of starting to do that? But yeah, Chris, go, go ahead. In thinking about that approach, I'm imagining a road where one person wants to drive, one person wants to use their horse, and one person wants to walk, like, and none of them wants to change their mode of transportation. Well, they can all still use the road. Um, and as long as that road does not start to weigh towards one of those modes of transportation, they can use it together. Whereas if the speed limit is 60 miles an hour, suddenly you can't use a horse or walk reasonably. And I think that's like, um, understanding if we want these things to be used by all these people we can't cater towards one form of transportation and not expect the other people to start going towards other forms of transport or other routes um and i think that's like ultimately this this gets back to like a nash equilibrium can apply on a road system as well in the sense of like if if things are moving to everyone's benefit then no one ever gets stuck in any particular place so if you come in looking for one piece of information the ux or ui isn't going to impede you um the language isn't going to impede your access um 
the sense of belonging isn't going to impede your access. So I think as long as we don't create a culture of like ivory tower syndrome or only looking at certifications and allowing people to not disclose or um, use experience instead of certification as a form of like the de declaration of experience or certification, then I'm, I'm not of the mind that one is one particular group is going to be excluded. And then in my experience, it's like, I try like in, in my own personal scurf experience, I know I don't want to become like, Oh, this person thinks they know everything about everything. So if someone is like, asking me questions and then another person comes on and answers the question correctly i don't step in to then add my level of authority it's like um there are behaviors and practices so that people feel welcome they feel part of a community but then they feel uh, uninhibited to ask questions of people who may have higher certification and not feel that their lack of certification prevents them from participating in the conversation. <laughs> so I think that's like, to me, as long as the lay person who comes into SCURF still feels welcome as part of the community, that's what we should make sure as long, like if we're allowing people to declare their certifications or their degrees or whatever, we have to make sure to do it in a way that doesn't make lay people feel excluded and I believe something like allowing people to declare their experience within a field or their background um, exposure to something like if somebody has been um, in, in involved in a community for 10 years, that's very important too. They don't have to have been professionally hired to do something within that community because that 10 years experience is very useful concerning their understanding of how that community operates. Um, so I do, I think in the sense of, there's a way that we can then use certification to allow people to represent their non-organized or non-organizationally approved experience to then say, if someone's been part of uh, like the Web3 community or um, been on the, open source forum community for five, 10 years, that's, that's experience too. But if they can't declare it, then no one will ever know that either. Right, so let me okay, give you an ahead. example of, of how the web of trust would work to do that. So um, let's pick on Eugene because he's not here. How many people here uh, think that Eugene is an expert on how SCURF operates? I imagine most people here would would say yes to that. So he is hereby certified by this group of people that he is an expert on SCURF operation. That's a web of trust right there. So now I, as a new person, I'm going to come in and be like, oh, he is trusted by all these people to talk on this subject right there. And they they you don't even need to brand it a certification, but you can if you want. So he's certified at SCURF operation. Perfect. I listen to him. And that can happen a thousand different times on a thousand different subjects at the same time. Uh, in some of the tools that hopefully will be built. I don't think anyone's actually building this automated system yet, but uh, I, I do think it's the way we go. And like the web of trust has been uh, spoken about and, and attempted many times, but not without or not with DLT. LinkedIn is a great example, actually. That's a similar sort of web of trust system, uh, but it's still dependent on a uh, trusted party to mediate it. Uh, and, and you can't just kind of build up your own uh, let's just call them DAOs. You can't build your own DAO to certify people. You can't build your own group to certify people in X, Y, Z. There's there's too many limitations to it. And it doesn't have that transparency and open sourceness you were talking about before. But absolutely a great example of a Web2 web of trust. So I'm kind of interested then also, right? So thank you for uh, bringing up the LinkedIn and that example of web of trust. Uh, I could see some places where that can get, um, that can also just reinforce uh, clicks for lack of a better word. But uh, if it is truly transparent, I think that we could kind of see those types of dynamics. Um, maybe a transition point in this conversation then is uh, how could we get, um, 
what does it mean to maybe put reputation on display, right? So we've kind of talked a little bit about like what reputation is, like how people kind of get it, transferability, tooling, things like that. Another dynamic uh, that we could maybe start to explore is, so let's say that SCURF uh, on the forum, um, if you, uh, the, you know, behaviorally, you had five or six different um, areas of interest. You had uh, the certifications from third parties. Uh, we as SCURF have kind of uh, certified you through a, a web of trust and then we kind of displayed that. Um, does that kind of fundamentally alter the types of interactions that are happening there is something that I'm also interested in as we explore like how can SCURF help people build the reputations um, and do something with that reputation, but also we wouldn't want to necessarily change the power dynamics uh, on the forum uh, but chris go ahead yeah this made me think um i posted an example of an expired certification that just expired in may um this certification was what gave me the um approval to do research rep that represented colorado technical university so now that that certification has expired i can't do any more research with ctu on the um the subject line or representing that university i don't have the approval but if i got recertified i'd be able to um and that uh, that certification is on my linkedin profile so anyone when i was doing my research if they wanted to check they would be able to go check that link and see that yes i got approval through my university to do the research that i was doing and it's these types of third-party validations that um like are good to keep human subjects protected ethically but also good standards and practices to have transparency concerning a person's certification and that's where i'm like oh yeah this is like a great example of this is one of those transparent practices where the more transparent and the more access one has to certification the easier it is to prove like yeah i went through um the uh program to educate me on ethic ethical practices for human subjects testing and that uh certification proves it but now that it's out of date the standards may have changed so that's why i'm not permitted to represent ctu with research and, and but if i if i updated that certification then i would be able to go uh represent ctu again And I think maybe then to the uh, highlighting the, the certifications or the, the reputation indicators um, to that point, like the fact that, so this happens to be expired, uh, but that you can still list it um, as a thing that you once had could potentially be influencing people's view of like, you know, so Chris knows how to do research, but maybe he just hasn't done it in a long time. Um, is that something that we would want to encourage or like something like badges, right? So like if I've had a badge before for X, Y, and Z reputational reason or uh, behavioral reason, should I still be able to um, display that badge or talk about that badge um, if it has expired? Like, so I'm a really good commenter on the forum. Um, I've won comment of the month uh, before. Um, is that something that we would want to display, allow people to kind of continue to display for a long time? Um, those are some of the things that I'm also interested in, like how do these get enacted into spaces and maybe how SCURF does that? Um, probably not something we're gonna solve in three minutes, but are there some initial uh, thoughts on the displaying of these things? Uh, badges as a solution um, of how do we kind of make reputation visible to others as opposed to just kind of holding it in the minds of networks um, any thoughts along that direction yeah. um Maybe sorry before. i raise my hand does anyone else want to go okay um the uh i think it's fine to display them i i also think people should ignore them like it so this goes back to social reputation versus uh tooled reputation i think like did uh i i don't care how many badges you have how many accreditations you're given, I'm going to judge whatever you say based on the merits of what it's said and the context in which it's said. So you could be, the, we, I, I actually know a lot of these people, you could be the biggest troll uh, in the world, in any community, but every once in a while, you just say something that is exactly on point and should be whatever's taken as truth. Uh, and it, if we trust, if we displayed that reputation of that individual as a troll, most people would ignore that very valuable 
uh, post. So there's, it, this goes back to, again, yesterday's conversation, the whole idea of the space is don't trust, verify, just just do your own work. Just look at a piece of context and like, if they're, they're trolling, ignore them and move on. I know not a lot of people do that, but it's, uh, I, I, I don't think gating someone behind reputation is, is something that's worthwhile in a, a technology that's trying to remove gates. I was just going to say Go ahead, yeah. really quick as a quick comment here is the idea that um, reputation as access. So there are places that <clears throat> where gates exist for like, you know, because people want gates to be there and it's a challenge, right? And it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier is um, how do, if I'm building, let's just say some kind of a gated community and I, uh, and I want to automate access to that community, how do I, how do I, as as a person who's letting people in, how do I look at the types of reputations that are out there swirling around in the endless vo you know the endless space of the internet? And how do I choose the ones that I like and the ones that I don't like? And there are you know there are actual Web 2.0 like standards solutions for this you know that use uh, crypt you know like cryptography and so on, passwords and two factor authentication and so on. But like, you know, what about Discord roles too? You know, and things like that. And because those those serve a similar, you know, fundamental function in a technical level of letting people in certain areas and not other areas. And and uh, I think there are some solutions, right? Weren't um, didn't we have like a presentation recently? Uh, gosh, maybe I'm, my memory isn't serving. That had well, it was the bounties. Is what it was, right? Uh, Aikido, I believe it was called um did they i might so i guess does anybody remember if it had reputation built into that at all or any kind of like access control i can't remember i do recall that being a potential discussion point uh chris go real quick because we are at time yeah i think aikido did have like the history of the person's um activity to be able to be tracked within the platform so it's like it yeah. was building their activity history reputation yeah, like that's where my brain goes to. There's like the theoretical side, which has like a really deep, and then like, and then literally like, you know, how do I use Web3 to automatically give somebody a role in Discord? Like, that's what I want to know right now. <laughs> that's that's the problem I'm trying to solve. So maybe we can roll that conversation over into the uh, the live channel for the coffee house, Jonathan. I don't know if that is something of interest to you. Yeah, uh, let's do it. And yeah. we're also going to talk about it tomorrow in the chat guild, uh, in the chat guild meeting. So, <laughs> the reputation is on everybody's mind. Uh, I want yeah. to thank everyone for contributing to this discussion today. Uh, I know that I'm going to probably be bringing up some of these thoughts. Like I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down. I'm um, looking forward to us as a community to continue talking about what is the role of reputation at SCURF uh, in Web3 in research. Uh, it's just fascinating areas of conversation for me. Um, but with that, I hope everyone has a great day, and I look forward to, as this goes onto the community section eventually, um, a continued long tail conversation on our forum as well. So I uh, hope everyone has a great day, and thank you.